This channel is part of the History Hit Network. The tragedy of Gallipoli so shook the nations of Australia and New Zealand that for a century it's cast a giant shadow over what happened next. And what happened next cost the lives of five times as many Anzacs as Gallipoli. And they died here. I'm Neil Pickett, an actor whose family has served in nearly every conflict since World War I, which has left me with a lifelong passion for military history. This was the main theatre of the First World War. This was the only place where the war could be won. And what happened here changed us and the world. I'm Dr Peter Patterson, military historian, former Australian Army Battalion Commander and former Assistant Director of the Australian War Memorial. In this series, we'll find out how significant a part the Anzacs played in deciding the outcome of the First World War here on the Western Front. Since 1914, Germany had been fighting on two fronts. But in 1917, Russia, racked by revolution, sued for peace. Which meant that by early 1918, Germany had been able to transfer 35 divisions between three and 400,000 men to the Western Front. After the successes of 1917, the Allies should have been going on the offensive. But the Allied Commander-in-Chief, Field Marshal Haig, simply lacked the manpower. The Germans, on the other hand, had all the men they needed. And in this episode, we'll find out how they used their numerical advantage to go all out for victory. In 1918, the civilian government in Germany was largely irrelevant. The High Command pulled the strings. But what are the German people to show for all their sacrifice? Where was the victory? And in its absence, could Germany avoid being gripped by the sort of revolution that had convulsed Russia? For the German High Command and the Kaiser, one last desperate push for victory was the only and urgent option. Ludendorff planned an unprecedented offensive for the spring of 1918, designed to bring the Allies to the table before America, with a million troops promised and unlimited resources, entered the fray. That spring offensive was called the Kaiserschlacht, the Kaiser's Battle. Ludendorff intended to smash the northern flank of the Western Front, the British sector, believing that its collapse would also lead to the French folding. With the extra German divisions moved from the east, the Kaiserschlacht, also called Operation Michael, began at 4.40 a.m. on the 21st of March, 1918. More than 6,500 German guns fired over 3 million shells in just five hours. Then three German armies and 700 aircraft attacked across an 80-kilometre front as Ludendorff attempted to force a wedge between the French and the British before driving onto the Channel ports and cutting the British off from their supplies. Operation Michael began with the most intense barrage of the war. Three and a half million shells in five hours. Winston Churchill, who happened to be visiting the front at the time, recalled. There rose in less than one minute the most tremendous cannonade. It swept round us in a wide arc of red, leaping flame. The British suffered more than 7,000 casualties from the bombardment alone. Ludendorff's official report said, the English position has disappeared and in its place, there extends a wide and desolate crater field. Amongst those German divisions were crack troops that would employ a new tactic. They'd bypass strongholds and drive deep behind Allied lines, leaving those strongholds for the infantry to mop up. And they had a name. They were called Stosstruppen, stormtroopers. In two days, they'd ripped a breach 64 kilometres wide in the Allied line and parts of the British Army were falling back in some places in disarray. Bombardier Henry Parkinson of the 7th Australian Field Artillery Brigade remembered the chaos. 
History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. We were on the way down with a forced march, and a lot of the uh, British troops were just coming out of the line going the opposite way. They used to call him Jerry. Jerry's just over the next hill. Turmoil and confusion are everywhere, said Private Alfred Gross of the 8th London Rifles. Where are we going? No one knows. Where's the 8th? Where's the 7th? Where's the 6th? We move. When the barrage exploded over this landscape, the Australians were holding the line at Racine to the north, away from the offensive area. But they could hear it well enough. It wasn't long before the Australians were rushed south to strengthen the line in the Somme. And in one of those curiosities of war, Monash's 3rd Division was transported with the aid of 32 of London's double-decker buses. The Allies' situation was desperate, and as Operation Michael opened huge holes in the Allied lines, the Anzacs were pushed forward to block them. The New Zealanders had barely recovered from months in the Ypres salient, were brought in to plug a gap on the Ankh River. Soon, both Australians and New Zealanders were engaged in fierce fighting, repelling enemy attacks. Like the one that raged around Colin Kong at Jeremiah Hedge and Lasigny Farm, which the New Zealanders finally took on the 30th of March. It was that action on that day by the Kiwis that hinted that maybe Operation Michael was running out of steam and that even stormtroopers could get exhausted. The Allied defence was regrouping and although Operation Michael was still making progress, German spirit was waning. Their supply lines were becoming stretched, food was becoming scarce, and as they overran Allied positions, they realised that their enemies were not suffering as they were. Meanwhile, other Australians had been in action on the Somme and further north on the Ankh at Dernancourt, where they relieved the Scots. When Captain George Mitchell was asked what troops they were, he said, 48th Australian, to which the Scots replied, Thank God, you'll hold them. It was at Dernan Corps that the 47th and 48th Battalions, both heavily outnumbered, saw off nine German attacks on the 28th of March. And Tasmanian blacksmith sergeant Stan McDougall ran along the railway embankment, shooting up the Germans who'd reached it with his Lewis gun. The VC citation puts it calmly. The prompt action of this non-commissioned officer saved the line and enabled the enemy's advance to be stopped. The battalion's war diary saw it rather more matter-of-factly. The men in the Lewis Gunners have had the time of their lives during the last 24 hours with the targets available. The British Fifth Army, which was next to the French, bore the brunt of the German assault and heavily outnumbered, crumbled. Its commander, General Goff, was blamed and relieved of his command. It is fair to say that Goff was responsible for the disasters that were Pozier and Bullecourt, but in March 1918, he oversaw a stubbornly fought retreat by an inexperienced and vastly outnumbered force. Now, if it had been the disaster, the shambles, the rout that it has been described in some histories, the outcome of Germany's desperate last throw of the dice might have been completely different. Our attention now turns towards a town just south of the River Somme. It's only a small town, but control of it and of the high ground on which it sits would give the Germans good observation towards Amiens, a great Allied supply and communication centre, and also enable them to bring their artillery to bear on it. The town is Villers Bretonneux. Above every blackboard in this village school, in VB, as the Australians used to call it, are written the words. N'oublions jamais l'Australie. Let us never forget Australia. Which begs the question, why? Because Operation Michael was bearing down on Amiens, which the Allies could not afford to lose, 
the Australians, against overwhelming odds, were ordered to hold the line at Villa Bretagne. The Germans, trying to take Amiens, began their assault on Villas Bretonne at 6.30 on the morning of April the 4th. The Australians were in the centre of the British line, defending the town. The British on either side of the Australians fell back, forcing the Australians to retire as well. It seemed certain that the town would fall. The loss of Villas Bretonne would have been a major setback. Bombardier Henry Parkinson explains why. If he'd have taken and held Villas Bretonne, it would be a downhill run right down to Amiens, which would have spent curtains for us pretty well. A second German assault left the Australian headquarters in the town as the most advanced part of the line. The position was desperate, and Lieutenant Colonel John Milne, commanding the 36th Battalion, agreed to launch a counter-attack. It started at 5.15 in the afternoon. Goodbye, boys, he said. It's neck or nothing and the 36th jogged towards waves of Germans emerging from the cover of Monument Farm. And when it became apparent what was going on, the 33rd Battalion joined the charge, then the 35th, some British armoured cars and cavalry, and the Germans withdrew. The Australians' first taste of battle at Villa Bretagne was over, but they'd be brutally reacquainted with it in the days ahead. Operation Michael's been launched. There's withdrawals on a massive scale. And now, Goff has often been accused of overseeing a rout, but it wasn't a rout. No, it's true. Some units didn't fight very well, but a lot of others did. And by the time the Australians had arrived on the Somme, Operation Michael was already faltering. When they got down to the Somme, they're confronted by troops going the other way. Some of the the most memorable scenes in the history of the AIF occur at this time. Uh, roads filled with retreating troops and refugees. One British soldier, for example, said, you're going the wrong way, uh, Digger. Jerry will soon be near you too. And that thought was just brushed aside. You've got to remember the, the state of mind that the Australians are in. Morale is sky high. They've been itching to enter this battle. The five Australian divisions had been grouped into a single Australian corps. Now, on the men in road was the first time that two Australian divisions had fought side by side. And one of the Australian divisional commanders said that he thought that the effectiveness of his division had been increased by a third because they'd been attacking alongside their mates in another division. And now you've got five divisions together in one corps. What was the reaction of the French when the Australians arrived? When they arrive in Villas Bretonneux, the Australians would say to French civilians who were on the roads, Fini retreat, Boku Australians, EC. The French embraced them because that's the state of mind that uh, was typical of the Australian Corps at this time. It didn't matter what the Germans were doing. The Australians had this confidence that they would be able to cope with it. The Australian defence of Villa Bretagne proved Operation Michael, now hopelessly overextended, was over. But with the risk of unrest on the home front growing, the German High Command couldn't afford to stop there. They followed Operation Michael with Operation Georgette and began attacking on the Lys River on April 9th. The 1st Australian Division was rushed north to protect another important British communications hub the town of Hazebrook. As with Amiens, Hazebrook was strategically vital. With the German focus now shifted to this Belgian town, its defence became paramount. On the 11th of April, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig issued a special order of the day to all ranks of the British Army in France and Flanders. There is no other course open to us but to fight it out, he wrote. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight to the end and fight they did. But by mid-April, Operation Georgette was running out of steam. And an effort to divert British attention, and because they still believed that Amiens was achievable, the Germans decided to have yet another go at Villa Bretagne. On the 17th of April, the Germans drenched Villa's Bretagne in gas, causing a thousand Australian casualties. Because of a combination of battle losses and exhaustion from continuous fighting, the Australians had earned a spell and were rotated out of the line. A week after the Australians had been withdrawn and replaced by fresh but poorly trained British troops, 
the Germans attacked with tanks in support and the town fell. The 13th and 15th Australian brigades were brought up to the outskirts of Villers Bretonneux and set to retake it yet again. The 13th moved around the southern side, the 15th around the northern. And when the 15th closed up on the town, the 57th Battalion and the 2nd Royal Berkshires moved into it along this street. The Lewis gunners spraying the front of any houses from which German fire came, while bombs grenaded the back. Despite the Lewis guns and grenades, Sergeant Downing reported that the 15th charge could be heard from across the town. The yelling rose high and passed to the 58th and 60th battalions, baying like hellhounds. Private Sidney Norris recalled that approach to Villa Bretonneur. When we got up to Villa's Bretonneur and things were in a hell of a mess. There were carts upside down, guns busted, all sorts of things there. Horses dead everywhere and few men, of course. Sergeant Downing wrote, there were houses burning in the town, throwing a sinister light on the scene. It seemed there was nothing to do but go straight forward and die hard. Almost as soon as the 13th moved, it was ripped into from the left. Lieutenant Clifford Sadlier, a commercial traveller before the war, rallied the survivors, overwhelmed the numerically superior Germans and earned a Victoria Cross. Of the Australian attack, a German soldier wrote, the leading men fall, but others charge on. These two are mown down, but new waves always come on cheering in their place. On the 15th side, the Germans couldn't see. Their night vision was gone because Villa Bretonneur was burning behind them. So the battalions got halfway to the town before they were seen. In the early morning of Anzac Day 1918, the 57th Battalion and the 2nd Royal Berkshires entered Villa Bretonneur, bayonets fixed. And by nightfall, the town was cleared. Amiens was no longer threatened. Operation Georgette was floundering, Operation Michael had failed. Surely this extraordinary German offensive had done its dash. And so the Allies began probing for weaknesses in the German lines. By the middle of June, the Australians were firmly established on the Moorland Corps Ridge between the Somme and Ancre rivers, and on the southern side of the Somme, in front of Villers Bretonneux. German power was waning and the Australians, like the rest of the Allies, would go on the offensive. The years of static warfare were over and for the first time they'd be led by an Australian and he'd put into practice what he'd learned about fighting a modern war. His name was John Monash, an extraordinary and in some ways unique figure. Monash's family, German Jews, emigrated to Australia before John was born. You would think, given his heritage, he would have been an outsider. But his intellect, his decisiveness, his ability to bear great strain and his forceful but congenial personality created great loyalties in both his civilian and military careers. He joined the militia at university and on the eve of war was probably the most talented senior officer in the citizen military forces. When he went ashore on Gallipoli, it was as a senior officer who had never seen active service. He rose through the chain of command until he took over the Australian Corps in May 1918. But Monash was not without his detractors. Influential journalist Keith Murdoch, along with Australia's official war correspondent Charles Bean, tried to block the appointment. Bean wrote, We do not want Australia represented by men, mainly because of their ability, natural and inborn in Jews, to push themselves. But Prime Minister Billy Hughes found that Monash had the overwhelming support of the Corps commanders, all of whom were now Australians and the appointment was confirmed. And so it was Monash's planning as Corps Commander that would determine how the forthcoming battles would be fought. He planned what's called an all-arms battle in which infantry, artillery, tanks and aircraft all worked together. It was just the sort of battle that was ideally suited to a man who had a genius for the logistics of engineering the handling of large bodies of manpower, and above all, who was a master of the weapons and tactics of his day. With the support and encouragement of General Sir Henry Rawlinson commanding the 4th British Army, of which the Australian Corps was part, he put his ideas to the test on the 4th of July, 
American Independence Day. And rather fittingly, 800 recently arrived American troops joined the Australians. Their objective was this high ground surrounding the village of Hamel. Though the Germans were running out of steam, they weren't finished. Notwithstanding the failures of operations Michael and Georgette, they now struck the French further south. The British were asked to lay on attacks to tie down German reserves, and the Australian capture of Hamel on the southern side of the Somme was one of the proposals considered. The capture of Hamel would have the advantage of bringing the Australian line on both banks of the Somme level and leave more room for the defence of Villa Bretonneux. But Monash thought that Hamel was too tough a nut to crack. Tanks were the game changer. The Australians had disliked tanks intensely ever since they'd been badly let down by them at Bullock Corps in 1917. But on seeing the improved performance of the new Mark V tanks, Monash told Rawlinson he could take Hamel if he were given some. He got 60, which he deployed with 10 battalions along a five kilometre front. The plan also allowed for aircraft to drop ammunition to resupply the advancing infantry. One of the first airborne supply drops. The war diary of the 16th, a battalion largely raised in Queensland, said that the parachute method of delivering ammunition proved a great success. The advance began with this valley shrouded by fog, thickened by smoke screens and dust thrown up by the barrage. Some of the tanks lost their way in the murk. But most of the tanks made it through and they crawled their way through their valley up the hill towards the higher ground. Herbert Campbell, a New Zealander who'd enlisted at the beginning of the war and joined the Australians, remembered seeing the tanks go in. It was a great thing to see them in, in action. We could go into battle knowing that we had a new powerful weapon that was probably going to end the war. Now, despite the fact that Hamel was an all-arms battle, individual acts were as important here as anywhere else. The action required the Australian 15th Battalion to come from the top of that hill, two and a half kilometres to the top of the hill beyond the village there, the Wolfsburg. Now, this is a sunken road in the vicinity of Pear Trench, where the Germans were entrenched, and they were ripping into the Australians with three machine gun posts, one of which was knocked out by Private Henry Dalziel, who earned himself the Victoria Cross. And one of the extraordinary things about Dalziel is that later in the action, when he was bringing ammunition up to the front line, he was shot in the head, it shattered his skull and exposed his brain. He recovered and he lived for 50 more years, becoming a popular songwriter in his day, with hits like, You Never Know What You Can Do Till You Try. By the time dawn was breaking over the battlefield, the tanks had paved the way for the 44th Battalion to advance up the slopes of this feature, the Wolfsburg, a German headquarters and strong point. 93 minutes after the attack began, the Blue Line, which was the objective of the attack and which ran along the crest of the Wolfsburg, had been reached. The Battle of Hamel was over. The victory at Hamel was a complete one. Under the heading prisoners, the 16th Battalion's war diary simply said, a great many, but it's impossible to state numbers. Ever meticulous, Monash had gone to extraordinary lengths to conceal the preparation for the attack from the enemy, and it worked. The diary of the 44th noted, the attack being a complete surprise to the Bosch, the attacking troops were all over him before he had time to organise his defence. George Clemenceau, the 77-year-old Prime Minister of France, nicknamed the Tiger, visited the Australians a few days after the battle and his speech to them is recorded on the Australian Corps Memorial here in Hamel. He said, I am glad to be able to speak at least these few words of English because it enables me to tell you what all French people think of you. We knew you would fight a real fight, but we did not know that from the very beginning you would astonish the whole continent with your valour. General Monash's motto was feed your troops on victory and Hamel certainly was a victory. The methods Monash used became the template for the much bigger set-piece battles that lay ahead.
For the Anzacs, there would be a relative calm before what was going to be a devastating storm. And their greatest loss in late July was when a shell fragment struck and killed New Zealand's greatest frontline soldier just 24 hours after he'd single-handedly captured a 250-metre stretch of trench near Rosignol Wood, an action for which he would be posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. Sergeant Richard Travis of the 2nd Otago had become known as the Prince of No Man's Land. He was unorthodox and in the words of a comrade, he loved the game. He's the only man I ever met who did, but he truly did. The Germans' final offensive was smashed by the French and following a successful French counterstroke on July 18, momentum had firmly swung to the Allies. They planned a series of coordinated offensives starting early in August. The French would strike on the Marne, the Americans would eliminate the San Mihail salient to the southeast, and the British would have the dominant role in the Anglo-French advance in front of Amiens, back on the Somme. The war was soon to reach its climax. With the Australians and Canadians in leading roles, the Germans were about to suffer what General Ludendorff dubbed the Black Day in the history of the German army. Some of the most famous names on the Australian and New Zealand honour rolls Perron, Mont Saint Quentin, Le Quinoir lay ahead of us. The tragedy of Gallipoli so shook the nations of Australia and New Zealand that for a century it's cast a giant shadow over what happened next. And what happened next cost the lives of five times as many Anzacs as Gallipoli. And they died here. I'm Neil Pickett, an actor whose family has served in nearly every conflict since World War I, which has left me with a lifelong passion for military history. This was the main theatre of the First World War. This was the only place where the war could be won. And what happened here changed us and the world. I'm Dr Peter Patterson, military historian, former Australian Army Battalion Commander and former Assistant Director of the Australian War Memorial. In this series, we'll find out how significant a part the Anzacs played in deciding the outcome of the First World War here on the Western Front. As we saw in the last episode, German counterattacks in early 1918 brought the Allies close to defeat. In this episode, we follow the Anzacs as they join the offensive that would lead to victory. The Battle of Hamel, masterminded by the Australian General Monash, boosted morale and combined with the success in July of the French counterstroke, demonstrated that the tide had turned. The imperative now was to press on with the attack. To sweep the Germans back, the Americans would eliminate the San Mihail salient, the French would strike on the Marne, and the Anzacs, as part of the Anglo-French offensive, would attack on the Somme. Now this might just look like a gully, but it's actually one of the few surviving trenches from 1918. And it's night on August the 7th, and the diggers know what's up because they've received their orders. So maybe they scribble a note, a last letter home. My dear mother, brothers, sisters, wrote Private Henry Wright from somewhere in France. I'm going into a big fight and just thought I'd write a few lines because one never knows what might happen. I'm going into the great fight with a good heart and loving thoughts of all of you. At 20 past four on the morning of August the 8th, the British Fourth Army, of which the Australian Corps formed part, attacked in front of Amiens. The Australian start line ran through this location and the Australians here advanced from it across this valley. It was the start of an unbroken series of victories called the 100 Days and Bombardier Henry Parkinson was part of it. Every gun in the battery opened up at once in sets of shell fire, and it was really the start of the finish. 
2,000 guns bellowed across the landscape in what Sergeant Walter Downing called a titanic pandemonium. Then, he said, came a low chug, chug, chug as the ugly noses of the tanks poked through the fog above us. The troops advanced, some platoons that's reported holding hands so as not to become separated and lose direction in the fog. Then, Downing said, the rattling of machine guns told us that the lads in front were in contact with the enemy. Ralph Scobie describes how he got the order to go over the top. Jack Adam, he ran along the top of the trench and he bawled out, fix bayonets and load up. Up, boys, and Adam. Keep going, there is no objective. Just on zero, I issued a tot of rum to all ranks, recalled Lieutenant Wilkinson of the 6th Machine Gun Company, adding, my own stimulant was my old favourite, cold tea from my water bottle. The British Fourth Army, which included the Australians and supported by 2,000 guns, cavalry, armoured cars and 552 tanks, would advance 11 kilometres in three stages. Four Australian divisions would advance in pairs and Monash determined because of the length of the assault they'd have to leapfrog each other twice. Now in the heat of battle, this is an incredibly complex manoeuvre that not only demonstrated Monash's ingenuity in planning, but the skill of the men he commanded. Despite the fog, the advance went relatively smoothly and only the 7th Australian Brigade encountered intact wire. Lieutenant Alfred Gaby, a Tasmanian labourer, led his platoon through it and cleared the trench on the other side, for which he was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. In the last of his regular letters home, Gabby would written, it's two years this week that I came to France, another two years should see it out. And Gabby wasn't the only pessimist. Private Albert Golding wrote, we tell each other that the war is just about over, but each one knows that it won't end for three or four years yet. As the advance speared past La Motte-Wafusée, pockets of German resistance were dealt with, and by seven in the morning, the second and third Australian divisions were consolidating on a line just the other side of this road. At 20 past eight, with tanks advancing ahead of them instead of the usual creeping barrage, the fourth and fifth Australian divisions leapfrogged the second and third here and continued the advance. By noon, Monash was signaling General Rawlinson, Australian flag hoisted over Harbonnière. Four days later, Monash was knighted by King George V, reputedly the first time in almost 200 years that the Sovereign had conferred a knighthood in the field. Great news, said Sapper Harold Grant. Australians caught Fritz snapping. Sergeant Francis Corson put it simply, Trayvon stunt, I wouldn't have missed it for worlds. The legendary British military historian, Sir Basil Liddell Hart, summed up the achievement admiringly. The Australians and Canadians, matchless attacking troops, he wrote, surged irresistibly over the enemy's forward divisions. The Australians took 7,000 prisoners, the Canadians on their right 6,000, and the French in their sector 3,500. Der Schwarze Tag des Deutschen Heeres, the black day of the German army, as Ludendorff called it, was black for him because it seemed that everywhere he looked, there was evidence of a decline in German fighting spirit. Following the triumph of August 8th, it was clear now that the war could have only one outcome. But the Germans weren't finished yet. And there were fierce battles and devastating losses to come. Although the Battle of the 8th of August was a stunning success, the Allied advance had stalled. The Germans, reacting with their trademark swiftness, marshaled their reserves and their resistance stiffened. Also, mobility was returning to warfare here. But the commanders, who'd become used to the static warfare of the past few years, understandably had trouble adjusting to it straight away. Even Monash fumbled briefly. And the advance had reached the old Somme battlefield, which was still pockmarked and churned up, making movement across it difficult. Meanwhile, the New Zealand division had been advancing with the Third Army 30 kilometres to the north. Their action was officially known as the Battle of Albert, but because they were fighting pretty much right here, just outside the town of Bapom, they've always called it the Battle of Bapom, and it was a tough battle, costing more than 3,000 New Zealand casualties and over 800 dead, many of whom are buried right here. 
On the 24th of August, under the cover of darkness and in driving rain, the New Zealanders moved towards Papone in a silent assault. Second Auckland were held up by a strong point that Sergeant Sam Forsyth dealt with, earning him a Victoria Cross, awarded posthumously. My dear husband's last letter was very sad, Mary Forsyth wrote, and I believe he must have felt it must be a farewell letter as he spoke of things in it that he had never said to me in his life before. By late August, the British Third Army had advanced to within three kilometres of Bapalm, which the New Zealand Division now faced. The Germans reinforced their eight divisions opposing the Third Army with another nine, and resistance stiffened. On the 25th of August, 1st Auckland and 2nd Wellington were stopped south of Bapalm. 1st Otago and 1st Canterbury attacking on their left were also checked. As one Kiwi soldier said, Bapalm is turning out to be a tough nut to crack. On the third day of the offensive, the 26th of August, the New Zealanders gained just 450 metres, but Sergeant Reg Judson of the 1st Auckland knocked out three machine guns and was awarded the second of the Victoria Crosses. And quite astonishingly, Judson earned all three gallantry awards available to him in the space of just six weeks. Thanks to his actions and others like it, the Kiwis were poised on the outskirts of the palm. Having taken almost three and a half thousand casualties, they now prepared to take the town. The New Zealanders held fast for two days while they planned an attack for the 29th, but enemy fire faded, and when they cautiously advanced, they found the Germans had abandoned Bapalm, leaving behind what private state of the first Auckland called nothing more than a few acres of bricks. The battle that became known as Bloody Bapalm was over. It was September the 2nd, and by then the Australians had made another name famous in their military history. Private Sidney Norris was there, and his memory of what happened was very much to the point. We had a over the top before we got to Mont St. Quentin, and uh, we crossed the bridge to Mont St. Quentin, uh, across the uh, Somme River, and we attacked there. Sydney Norris would have crossed the Somme here. Now, if the Allied advance had faltered in the days following Ludendorff's Black Day, the momentum was quickly regained and never again relinquished. And that was partly due to an extraordinary action launched by the Australians. The Fourth Army had been keeping pace with the Third, so the Germans fell back to dominating positions. Mont Saint-Quentin rises 100 metres above the Somme River near the ancient town of Perron and German defences there threatened the 4th Army's advance. The Australian capture of Mont Saint-Quentin was the only important fight in Australian experience of the Western Front in which quick, free manoeuvre played a decisive role. It was a battle in three phases. The capture of Mont Saint-Quentin itself, the securing of Bouquevin Ridge, and then the capture of Perron, which, just to complicate matters, sat behind a medieval moat and ramparts. Over four days, these interlinked actions involving the 2nd, 3rd and 5th Australian divisions took positions that were thought to be almost impregnable and gained gushes of disbelieving praise and eight Australian Victoria Crosses, more than for any other single Australian battle of the war. It wasn't just because the objectives were difficult and well defended. After a month of fighting, the Australian battalions were severely under strength. In many cases, down to just a third of their full fighting capacity. So it's hardly surprising that their discipline was being sorely tested. The behind the lines discipline of the Australians is something that's always commented on. It's true they weren't exactly spit and polished soldiers. You can hardly find an individual record that doesn't contain some indiscretion, be it absence without leave or, or getting drunk. But on the battlefield, the Australians were highly disciplined, which helps to explain why they were so effective there. And this place provides us with a great example, not only of discipline, but also of the larrikin spirit. The Australian battalions that had to attack what was essentially the German fortress of Mont Saint-Quentin across this open ground were severely under strength. So to convince the Germans that they were greater in number than they actually were, they did it, yelling their heads off. The assault came up this slope and it completely surprised the defenders. 
Before we had fired a shot, one of them said, we were taken unawares. The Australians swept through and captured the crest, but their hold on it was tenuous, and they were pushed back here to the line of Elsa Trench on which I'm now standing. So General Monash ordered the 3rd Division simultaneous assault on neighbouring Bukaven Ridge to be pressed even harder in order to prevent the Germans there from interfering with the open Australian flank here on Mont Saint-Quentin. A lot has been said about the so-called callous attitude of British generals, but it was Monash ordering that attack who told the 3rd Division's commander, General Gellibrand, casualties no longer matter. Because Monash knew that unless the Bukaven Ridge was secured, the 2nd Division's flank on Mont Saint-Quentin would be unprotected, with a very real risk of its gains on Mont Saint-Quentin being lost. With the Germans tied down on Book of Van Ridge, the Australian 2nd Division was free to launch an attack from Elsa Trench on Mont Saint-Quentin itself. Three separate Victoria Crosses were earned for bravery, but bravery in the face of enemy fire was not the only type of gallantry acknowledged that day. 26-year-old Donald Cooch from Victoria received the DSO for that action, but not for fighting, for operating. 52 hours virtually non-stop, five of those hours wearing a gas mask. He wrote, we kept going continuously. Two men came in, I had to amputate one man's arm at the shoulder, the other man's leg through the right thigh. For this, I used a razor. Even today, the crest of Mont Saint-Quentin is scarred by the remains of shell holes and trenches, and they bear eloquent testimony to the ferocity of the fighting for this feature. German morale may have flagged after the Black Day and worried Ludendorff, but according to one Australian battalion war diary, the Germans here made a determined and spirited resistance, in many instances, dying at their posts. It took one more assault on the 1st of September before Mont Saint-Quentin was permanently in Australian hands. And when it was all over, some of the German prisoners made the extraordinary statement that they'd volunteered to be the ones to stop the Australians. The tenacity demonstrated by the defenders was not enough to deter the assault, which now faced its third and final objective, the fortified medieval city of Perron. The 5th Australian Division attacked Perron, where one of its battalions, the 53rd, held up by a field gun, was able to advance because Private William Curry took it on himself to charge the gun single-handed, firing a Lewis gun from the hip. The Australians then reached the ramparts of the town and were able to get into it under fire over a partly destroyed bridge. Curry's VC was then added to by Privates Arthur Hall and Alexander Buckley both for charging machine gun emplacements. In his last letter home, Alex Buckley wrote to his brother, better days are in store for all of us. I feel sure I shall come through safely. But unfortunately, his VC was awarded posthumously. Donald MacArthur, a hospital attendant from Sydney, was mortally wounded. I am happy to die, he said. The war is won and I have lived to see it. Although the war hadn't been won, the outcome was no longer in doubt. The diary of the 54th Battalion reported, the whole of the operations were carried out with spirited dash and gallantry by our troops. Ralph Scobie was with the 54th, but his memory didn't dwell on dash and gallantry. My platoon, when we came to draw our rum after Perot, it was four of us to have 27 men's rum. The capture of Mont Saint-Quentin and Perron apparently stunned Rawlinson and amazed Haig, and this combined with the Canadians' almost simultaneous breakthrough near Bullecourt forced the Germans back to the Hindenburg Line, their last major defensive structure, much earlier than they'd intended. Monash and his British superiors were determined the success would be exploited. The Germans were falling back and the Allies would relentlessly pursue them. The Germans were on their knees with the fall of Perron. Haig declared that the assault on the Hindenburg Line, the Germans' last significant defensive structure, would commence on September 29th, and the Australian Corps would play a pivotal role in that attack. 
The Hindenburg outpost line had to be taken first and the 3rd and 4th armies attacked it on the 18th of September. The 3rd and 4th Australian divisions would be at the centre of the 4th Army's advance. The battle commenced in rainy fog. Gerald Sexton knocked out a field gun and several machine guns, earning a VC, which meant that he had to admit that his real name was Morris Buckley and that he'd been listed as a deserter in 1915. This is the site of Sergeant Sexton's VC action. The machine guns were on this side of the road, the field gun on the other side. The Australians went on to capture the Hindenburg outpost line on the high ground behind me. They lost just over 1,300 men, but took well over 4,000 prisoners. This meant that the assault on the Hindenburg line could go ahead. But first, Monash had to deal with some serious discontent. Because the Australian battalions were seriously under strength, it made sense that they should be broken up and the men used to bring other battalions up to full strength. It made no sense at all to the men in the battalions earmarked for disbandment. They'd been living and fighting together for up to three years. Faced with being broken up and with being separated from mates, several battalions went on strike. In military terms, this was a mutiny. Monash wisely deferred the implementation of the disbandment orders until after the attack on the Hindenburg Line. The defences of the Hindenburg Line were a sight that Ralph Scobie never forgot. And moving up through that Hindenburg Line area was just uh, something out of this world. The hills, as far as the eye could see, it was just an ocean, an ocean of barbed wire, like a great vineyard in the winter time. The Australian Corps had a leading role in the assault on the Hindenburg Line, but Monash only had three weakened divisions, so he was given two American divisions, both three times stronger than their Australian counterparts. The terrain over which the advance was to be made was hugely challenging. Pillboxes, strong points, six belts of wire, and the San Catan Canal. And this is it, the San Catan Canal the Hindenburg's first line of defence, an obstacle that had to be overcome, surrounded by machine gun emplacements along its bank and above it. Now, Monash favoured an attack across the roof of this tunnel, which runs for several kilometres. He reasoned that an attack across the top would be like an attack across open ground, but Rawlinson overruled him. He felt that an attack in one place would be too risky. So he widened the frontage of the assault by including the canal. And it turned out he was right, because the assault on the tunnel with the Americans leading the Australians was held up. But it was helped by the spectacular advance of the neighbouring British 46th Division, which swept across the canal here. Monash swung the Australians into the breach. They advanced astride the main Hindenburg line and cleared it in what he calls slow and methodical hand-to-hand -hand fighting in a perfect tangle of trenches. Lieutenant Joe Maxwell of the 18th got his VC when the Australians pushed further. It meant that he'd received the Distinguished Conduct Medal, the Military Cross and the Victoria Cross, all in the span of less than 12 months. You Australians are all bluff, complained a German officer prisoner. You attack with practically no men and are on top of us before we know where we are. That's high praise, but the capture of the Hindenburg system cost the three Australian divisions involved almost 4,000 men. It had been a brutal, grinding effort. Norman Young from Bendigo was there. He was 18. He said, this was my first actual stunt with Fritz. Though it's only some hours since we attacked, I feel as though I have lived weeks and weeks. In one further action on the 5th of October, the Australians captured the village of Mont Braham. It was their last action of the war and it cost 100 Australian lives, among them of men who'd fought at Gallipoli. It also saw the war's last Australian Victoria Cross go to Lieutenant George Ingram, who leapt into this strongly held quarry strong point, killed several defenders, which prompted over 60 more to surrender, and then cleared the house behind me. The war might have been over for the Australians, but for the New Zealanders, what is arguably their finest hour lay ahead of them. While the Australians were fighting at Mount Brahan, the New Zealanders had been resting behind the line. But on the 20th of October, they were back, and within two weeks, 
they closed in on this place, the 12th century fortress town of Le Quenois. They had no wish to pummel such a historic place with artillery. So they twice called on the besieged garrison to surrender. The garrison said it wanted to, but their officers wouldn't let them. So the New Zealanders, trying to take a medieval town, appropriately resorted to a medieval solution, a scaling ladder. And they did it right here. Probably the first man over the ramparts was Lieutenant Les Avril of the 4th Rifles. When he appeared, the nearest German bolted, and in Avril's words, the Germans threw up the sponge. His men followed him, and resistance crumbled. One week later, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the guns finally fell silent. This is a pretty special place with respect to the legacy of the war or our, or our knowledge of it or our memory of it is. This is certainly a special place. This is Tuggeranong Homestead in Canberra. And it's here that Charles Bean wrote part of the official history. Well, what was the legacy of World War I? Not just for the world, but for Australia. It's what the men of the AIF did in 1918, the central role they played in the advance to victory meant that through them, Australia had influenced the destiny of the world for the first time, mm -hmm. and arguably more than at any other time since. It must have been quite traumatic when the battalion started to get broken up. What, what was the feeling amongst the men? When the war ended, there was no great sense of rejoicing amongst the men of the AIF. The AIF were breaking up, and George Mitchell, one of the great soldiers of the AIF, he said, the battalion, our mother and father of unforgettable years, was slowly becoming no more. What was the sense of, the, of, of the, the scale of the loss? When you think about it, over 400,000 Australians joined up. Of those, 330,000 went overseas. Two out of three men became a casualty. Only one returned unscathed. And this is another reason why there was no elation or rejoicing, as one of them said, too many of our pals have gone to that far off home from which no wanderer ever returns. The Allied victory in 1918 and the part that the Anzacs played in it are among the principal forces that have shaped our modern world. And it was a victory. It's become fashionable to suggest that the Allies didn't win, that the Germans somehow gave up or worse, in Hitler's rhetoric, were stabbed in the back. They were not. After four years of struggle, sacrifice and hard fighting, the Australians and New Zealanders achieved what they set out to do. They met the main strength of the enemy here on the Western Front and they played a significant part in his defeat. More than 46,000 Australians and 12,000 New Zealanders remain here and very few of them were professional soldiers. In fact, all of the Australians were volunteers. They came from every corner of our countries, from every walk of life to this place to fight for something that they believed in. And for that, we honour every one of them.